Hi, this is Libby. And this is Roberta. And this is Art Blog Radio. Today we're talking with Josh Mosley. He is an artist who makes video, animations, and sculptures used in the videos. Josh's critically acclaimed work that was in the Venice Biennale in 2007 was also in a solo show at the ICA in Philadelphia two years later. He has received a number of prestigious art awards, including the Rome Prize and the Pew in 2008. Josh is the chair of the Department of Fine Arts at Penn Design, where he teaches and we're sitting in his office on the third floor in Adams Hall. We looked at your course syllabus for computer animation and saw this advice for your advanced animation students. Back up your files on DVD-R and your H drive and save sequential versions of your projects and scenes. Files stored on lab computers may become corrupt or deleted at any time. So have you had tragedy strike you on your computer? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So when I was in school, I lost everything. I lost everything that I did in the first two months of grad school and started over. And all of the graduate students lost everything that they were working on because we all shared one hard drive. Um, we, all, we all had uh, one, I don't remember how big it was, maybe 100 meg hard drive or 500 meg hard drive. And um, we were working on SGI computers. And so we didn't, um, it wasn't as simple as putting in a disk and backing up because there wasn't any disk that was large enough. Uh, the whole department had one CD-ROM burner, um, and this is at a computer that was uh, at a school at the Art Institute that was pretty um, far along with computers. What, what's um, an SGI? Uh, Silicon Graphics Computer. It's a company that um, made servers and large computers in the late 80s, 90s, and and so they were the computers that you needed to make 3D animation before you could do that on uh, Windows or Macintosh. So have you ever written code yourself? You sound like you're so inside the computer that you might have at some point yeah. written your own code. Yeah. For, for, for what purpose? Well, for example, in um, Beirut, when, um, they're under, when it's under the water and there's the things that are rotating around, um, there's a small program that control, controls a large number of things. There, there's something that controls the speed of it that's a program, a small program. These aren't complicated programs like um, some of my computer animation students here at Penn. If they're coming from the engineering side, they've taken several, several semesters of programming. But, I'm, but my, my, it's, like, it's like understanding another language. I can't speak fluently in it, but I kind of understand the underlying principles, so I, can, I, I use reference books a lot. Uh, I, I, I tried to use it in grad school to come up with an idea. I put all of the pieces of my all of my thoughts into a container and tried to pull them out in different ways, in different orders, to try to see if there was some... It would be kind of just like picking things out of a hat. Can you give an example of what those... Ideas a, would have a been. A couple thoughts, yeah. Well, like the idea... We know a lot of things, and so we have sort of like a database of knowing small things. Like as you're sitting there during the day, you would you you sort of... Um, you refer to a lot of things that you know. That would be like one of the ideas. And then another idea would be the distance between Bill Gates and everything else. Um, and that the company was, the market part of the company was virtual, was different than the, than the product part of it. I have these two ideas. And now, should I put them together or should they be a, a linear, should there be a linear transition? And so it was kind of a, an intermediate step to th figuring out, well, in my work, how should I deal with having two ideas that are actually overlapping but kind of... Um, so let's get yeah. right into your work then okay. because yeah. that duality absolutely mm -hmm. is in some of the work that I'm familiar with where you have two individuals who are historical characters like Pascal and Rousseau in your work Dread, which was in the Venice Biennale and at the ICA in 2009. Um, and they never met in the real world, but you have them meet. So can you talk about why you, you did that, the pairing of the two? I thought that Pascal was, Pascal was a central character. I think in order to show him, I had to have the questions that putting him next to Rousseau would raise because he became he became a sharper character basically I think I kept reading it I kept reading Rousseau looking for 
something that didn't make him like an idiot. In <laughs> like, um, I, I guess I kept I kept looking for that, and I then I started to use him to sort of sharpen up Pascal. I think Pascal at certain t- like believed in God at certain times, but I don't think that that interfered with his logic. And Rousseau's, I thought, was like he's like kind of inhibited by his by his spiritual belief. So by having them together, I think that, that I could I could sharpen Pascal's re- resolve about seeing and believing by yes. by putting them together. By putting them together, I didn't I but I don't know when I start out a project that that's what's going to happen. Been. I, did, I didn't know that, and, and and usually it does take me like a good six or six or nine months to to feel a, a full sense of what I'm working on. It's not exactly that it, animation takes a lot of time, but if there's not a consistency, then it rambles. I guess I'm trying to wait until things bubble down a little bit so that when I make a five-minute piece, um, I'm going to be kind of rationally dealing with a topic. Otherwise, I would go from something like complete abstraction to something representational, and um, and then I would be trying to resolve it in editing rather than resolving it. Um, I try to let it bubble down a little bit. So we've been talking a lot about how you do what you do, mm-hmm. but I want to know more about what it is that you're making work about in a way. I sort of feel like when I look at your, um, at your videos that there's a sadness to them and a surreal quality to them. I, and they're funny, too. I mean, they have a, a humor in them. And it's the content that makes this work, in addition to its technical wizardry, it's the content that makes it amazing. I think that well, there's the two kinds of content, and I'm I'm really paying attention to that right now in the part of the project that I'm doing. One of the kinds of content that I've been dealing with is the the historical things that I'm collaging together. But then there's the content that you're talking about, which is the emotional, yeah. the yeah, and and I think that that has been um, another character. And there's a moment of silence, and there's a look of when puppets are looking at each other. And when they're still and the environment's moving, there's an, there's an expression there. So we're sitting at a table, and it's filled with these drawings of... Um, they're sort of abstracted imagery. And I'm wondering how you get from abstracted imagery to, um, to this feeling. No, I don't expect... I guess I don't expect these images to lead me towards that feeling. What I'm trying to do with the images is take a step towards getting to the feeling without using the technique that I've used before. The feeling changes. I'm sure the feeling changes. But in, uh, So one thing that I'm thinking about now is the kind of feeling that, that there's a series of events that are outside of your control. You observe things. You start to see a pattern. You see the pattern happening, and that's outside of your control. And then, and then you can respond to that in multiple ways. You can say, and that's like a Rousseau, and that's the power of God. Or you can, and Pascal, and there can be sort of a simultaneously like in, inner fascination and inner terror. Like if you start to think of yourself as being like another living thing, and you watch the other living thing um, grow up and die, then you see everything. You see these these forces being stronger than your imagination. These abstract drawings, I was what I was trying to think about was the way that we um, look at things and start to, to start to see patterns or order in them. And this may be a part of the animation, but I want to have two non-historically specific characters playing a game. There's an onlooker who's watching the game, and then from a fourth perspective, there's the film being made. Game is a game where someone hits a ball and then the ball ricochets off of a number of surfaces. There's no story necessarily because the story is something that um, I'm pretty clear, I'm getting, I guess I'm, I'm pretty clear that the story is something that happens on the side of the animation after it's made. What do you mean by that? That it's, um, uh, it's what people take away from it. It's the oh, it's the recollection of the animation is the story. You have a fish drawing on the wall mm-hmm. that you said was going somewhere. Yeah. 
Can you explain a little bit more there about was a where poem, that's going? When I, when I was in residence in Rome in 2007 or 2006, I was reading something that, I was reading a poem written more than 2,000 years ago, and it was about a large number of things, and the one thing that I extracted from it that I think is going to survive in my animation is the idea that when a fish swims, it's moving from place A to place B, Place A used to have the fish in it, and now it needs to have water in it, so it creates a vacuum that needs to have water go into the place where it used to be in order to move to the second place. I thought that that was uh, enough to stop reading and just close the book and think about for a while. <laughs> like, um, because uh, because this, is, this is science before it's time. The idea that, something, that you have to replace something with something, you can't replace it with nothing. Do you think that having a child has had any influence on the work that you make? I don't know what it is, um, but it, I'm sure, um, because, I, because a lot of things have had... A, I, I think that the animations should work on multiple levels. I, I, there's so many ways to answer that question, I, I don't know. I mean, one is that I... I it's, it's sort of like a, observing the way that learning happens at, at an earlier stage. Um, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of a fresh, it's a fresh review of the way that our minds work and the way that, our, the way that we take in things. Um, like to have an interaction with a two-year-old where you say a word and you hear them repeat it wrongly and then you say it again and you hear them repeat it uh, less wrongly. It progresses a little bit and you realize that you're learning how to hear simultaneously with learning how to speak and probably the that means that that has to relate to you're learning how to see at the same time that you're learning how to draw. You, you're narrowing in basically on, on understanding things and you pretty much um, will never be there. And you start to recognize types of things, um, categorize them, and then at a certain point you shut off and you stop learning. The stopping to me is as interesting as the starting. Um, because the, the idea that the, the ability to learn language diminishes as you grow older makes me understand how people uh, sort of evolve a political position and then a philosophy or a, a structure, and then it becomes solidified and then it becomes reinforced. That just becomes clearer when I see the early development. It's, a, it's sort of like a model for our longer-term evolution. Well, thanks so much for talking with us, Josh. It's been really great. Thank thanks you. for coming. Thanks for visiting. Thank you. Art Blog Radio is brought to you by theartblog.org. Thanks to our sponsors, including the Knight Foundation. Also, we want to thank Peter Crimmins, who makes us sound good. He's our editor. And thanks to Eric Biondo for his music. You can download these podcasts at theartblog.org slash radio.